And uh, thank you for joining me and allowing me to be into your home tonight. Uh, as Karen said, my name is Kirk Berger. I'm the assistant director of the Glen Allen Historical Society. Um, if you happen to have attended the College of DuPage Native Advocacy Roundtable last March, you'll be very familiar with the topic I'll be covering tonight. Tonight, I'll be giving a summary of the Native American historical presence in what we know of today as Glen Allen. I'll be speaking mostly of the local Potawatomi peoples of the early 19th century. More specifically, I'll be addressing the large Potawatomi village that was once located in what we know of today as Churchill Woods Forest Preserve. However, tonight we'll have a little bit more time and we'll go into the topic in greater depth. The Potawatomi were the predominant population in Glen Ellen at the time of the arrival of the first white settlers in 1834. It is thanks to these settlers, we have a written historical description of their interaction with the area's Potawatomi inhabitants. Keep in mind, these descriptions were exclusively written by the white settlers, and we have no account of the Potawatomi's perspective of these same interactions. Before we get too far into my discussion of Glen Ellen's uh, Potawatomi, I should note we know there were other indigenous peoples in this area prior to the Potawatomi. Unfortunately, we have no record or direct evidence of their having had permanent settlements within Glen Ellen. But there is plenty of physical evidence found not far from here to suggest that they may have. Archaeological surveys conduct conducted just southwest of here in 1970 at the National Accelerator Laboratory in Batavia unearthed 17 Native American sites. Some of the artifacts found at these sites dated back to the Archaic period, or roughly to 6,500 BC. To put this into perspective, this is about 3,000 years before the great Egyptian pyramids at Giza were built. During the Archaic period, indigenous people became less nomadic than their Paleo-Indian ancestors. They were more sedentary and settled into seasonal villages following food sources availability. It's also at this time we see the beginnings of long distance trade networks. Keep in mind, people traveled everywhere at that time by foot. The horse would not be introduced to the mainland North American continent for another 8,000 years. The archaic Native Americans led a hunting and gathering way of life, not unlike the Paleo Indians, but a newly developed tool made the hunting more efficient. The atlatl was a grooved wooden handle from about three to six feet long. A piece of bone or antler formed a hook on one end of the handle. The hunter would lay a spear on the handle with blunt end against the atlatl's hook. The hunter threw the spear, snapping the wrist at the end of the throw, propelling the spear forward off the handle. The atlatl increased the speed, distance, and the force of impact to the spear throw. During the Archaic period, we also see the beginnings of the making and use of pottery. Meals were prepared by boiling water in watertight baskets. Red hot rocks were dropped into these baskets, bringing the water to a quick boil. Foods were also cooked over open fires and in roasting pits. In 1931, and again in 1975, archaeological digs were made in West Chicago, less than six miles west of here along the west branch of the DuPage River. These digs conducted by the University of Chicago and Wheaton College at the Winfield Burial Mounds and a nearby village site found evidence of people having lived here for a period of over 1,300 years. The better known of these sites, the Winfield Mounds dates back to around 300 BC or the early woodland period. This period is identified with mound building and the establishment of trade extending across large areas of North America. The early woodland peoples moved in small groups to take advantage of seasonally available resources, such as nuts, fish, shellfish, and wild plants. They relied on both wild and domesticated plants for food. By the early woodland period, the use of pottery became more plentiful and widespread than it had been previously. 
upriver from the Win, uh, Winfield Mounds, the Couch Village site, as it was inhabited for at least six different times from the late Archaic period to the late Woodlands periods from about 4,000 BC to 1,000 AD. Populations had increased during the late, oh, excuse me, the late Woodland period and settlements spread up rivers and streams filling the landscape. People continued to live in base camps, but the increase in population and greater proximity of campsites to one another led to a competition for resources. This, of course, led to an increase of territorial warfare. As a result, trade and interregional exchanges lessened. The late woodland period was also a time of important cultural and technological changes, such as the appearance of the bow and arrow. In the past, hunting had been a communal activity. Groups of hunters acted in unison to take down game. The bow and arrow allowed an individual hunter to be more self-sufficient. Though they still hunted for game and gathered nuts and other foodstuffs, they were no longer as greatly dependent on hunting and gathering. The late woodland peoples were adept at tending plots of maize, squash, and other food plants. So we know DuPage County had been occupied by indigenous peoples for at least 8,000 years before the first white settlers moved here in 1834. However, in other parts of Illinois, indigenous sites have been found dating back to as much as 10,000 years ago. I'd like to take a moment to clarify something I said earlier. Just seconds ago, I used the common term of white settler. The term white settler wrongly places an emphasis on the race of the settler. It places the importance on the settler's skin pigmentation and stresses a difference in genetics. Keep in mind, not all arriving settlers were Caucasian, which is just one reason why this commonly used phrase is, in my opinion, sloppy and a misleading term. It would be more correct to say those settling in Glen Ellen after 1834 were persons born into a culture that had originated in Europe. The story of this region in the early 19th century is a story of a dramatic shift in regional dominant cultures. It is not a story of a clash of two races as the term white settler would imply. This clarification is important and one I cannot stress enough. The earliest written history of Glen Ellen is a record of a pre-existing indigenous culture, one that originated here on this continent, being supplanted by peoples raised in a European-born culture. Okay, that's the historical background leading up to tonight's main topic, Glen Ellen's Potawatomi roots. Whoops, going the wrong way there, okay. So who were the Potawatomi living in Glen Ellen in the early 19th century during the historical period? What were they like? The Potawatomi were, and it's important to remember, still are an Algonquin people. They are an Algonquin culture. Their language is a derivative of the Algonquin language, which they share with the Ojibwa and the Ottawa nations. Oral traditions of the Potawatomi, Ojibwa, and Ottawa peoples assert that at one time, all three nations were one people, one nation. Linguistic, archaeological, and historical evidence suggest that they did indeed descend from a common ethnic origin, once living along the Straits of Mackinac. Together, these three nations formed a loose alliance called the Council of Three Fires. In fact, the name Potawatomi is a translation of the Ojibwa word Potawatomink, meaning people of the place of fire. The customs and languages these three nations share are nearly identical. Today, our modern American political system is based on a top-down political structure. By that, I mean that our federal government is the strongest seat of power, followed by the state government, county government, and lastly, local or village government. Each branch of government is the voice and maker of laws, ruling over the people that are under them. If the federal government decides we're at war with another country, we as citizens of the United States are obligated to work against said country. The Potawatomi of the 19th century do not seem to have had an overarching tribal organization. They may have at once had one at one time, but it did not exist by the 19th century. The most important political unit was the village, which in most cases moved periodically. The village would summer in one place and winter in another. There were no elected officials per se. Each village had its own chief. The chief was not a ruler of his village, but rather an authoritative advisor. 
A person could follow his advice or choose not to. His word was not law, but just wise counsel. Furthermore, a village could have as many or as few chiefs as it chose. The chief was assisted by a village council and a warrior class, which acted as a village safety and security force. If a chief decided to go to war with another tribe, an individual could decide for himself if he wanted to join in the fight. Adversely, if a handful of warriors decided to raid another village, a chief might advise them against it, yet he had no actual authority to stop them. Hunting parties, families, and small groups or bands were free to come and go as they pleased, even starting their own separate village if they chose to. This means that on a large scale, the Potawatomi were not a true unified nation. Each band, tribe, or village was free to decide on its own course of action and was not beholden to the decisions of a single leader, like a general or a president. This is not to say they never acted together. Many fought on behalf of the French during the French and Iroquois Wars of 1642 to 1701. We'll talk more about that later. Many sided with the French against the British during the French and Indian Wars of 1754 to 63. Later, they would band against the United States, this time on the side of the British in the War of 1812. But once again, in all of these cases, it was never all of the Potawatomi fighting just for one side. We can look to the Battle of Fort Dearborn during the War of 1812 as a perfect example of this. In June of 1812, the British captured Fort Mackinac on the Straits of Mackinac, which served as the key access point to Lake Michigan from Lake Huron. Captain Nathan Heald, commander of the small force of American military at Fort Dearborn, was ordered to abandon the fort and withdraw to Fort Wayne, Indiana, as holding the fort against the British, who now controlled the Great Lakes, seemed untenable. General Hull's orders were delivered to Heald by a Potawatomi leader by the name of Winnemeck. On the evening before the Americans' departure, Potawatomi leader Black Partridge met with Heald and warned him to be careful. Black Partridge explained his young warriors were bent on mischief and he could not restrain them. The following day, Heald's party was overwhelmed one and a half miles south of the fort by over 500 warriors under the direction of Potawatomi leaders Blackbird and Mad Sturgeon. Black Partridge, who had tried to dissuade Heald from leaving the fort, rescued a few of the survivors from a tortuous death by claiming them as his personal prisoners. This bottom-up structure of the Potawatomi society was often intentionally used against them by land treaty negotiators for the United States government. The signature of a few gathered chiefs and leaders was all that was needed to enact the rule of a treaty on every Potawatomi within the boundaries dictated by that treaty, whether they agreed to the treaty or not. In 1833, at a treaty council in Chicago, U.S. negotiators tried to secure a sweeping agreement with the Potawatomi to surrender all their lands east of the Mississippi River, receive compensation, and move west to a reservation that encompassed present-day Topeka, Kansas. As a negotiated settlement seemed within reach, a rather unassuming Potawatomi leader, Leopold Pokagan, stood up and asked, some of us are called wood Indians, although we are Potawatomis, and others are called prairie Indians. You have, my fathers, ask us to sell your land to your great father, referring to President Andrew Jackson, but we do not know what land you want. Putting this in a modern context, it would be as if Lombard and Villa Park Village presidents signed a contract selling off everyone's house in their towns and then decided to throw in Glen Ellen as a sweetener to the deal. Keep in mind, often these chiefs were trying only to get the best deal for the people they could understanding that submission and expulsion was inevitable. Now that, we, now that we understand the village was a Potawatomi center, what did a typical village look like? Anthropologist Ruth Landis in 1935 studied the Potawatomi who had been relocated to the reservation in Kansas. In her interviews with older tribe members, she found that the past the Potawatomi had lived in large villages of 60 or more families year round. 40 of these families would set up the village in a central circle facing each other with an opening facing toward a river. 20 or more families would set up outside the circle. Villages could vary in size and would fluctuate with the seasons depending upon the region's availability of food sources. This brings us to the question, 
Were the Potawatomi and Glaon always here, or did they come from somewhere else? Our first record of contact between Europeans and Potawatomi is in 1634. Jean Nicolet, a French trader, writes of meeting the Potawatomi on Wisconsin's Door Peninsula on the western shores of Lake Michigan. For the Potawatomi and other indigenous peoples, the introduction of an outside European culture was a catalyst for change with consequences beyond anything they could have imagined. In the mid 17th century, Europe had developed a great demand for American beaver pelts, partially because of its waterproof qualities. In an attempt to dominate the fur trade of the Western Great Lakes region, the Iroquois, supplied with Dutch and English firearms, aggressively expanded their territory westward into Huron, Sauk, Fox, and Potawatomi lands. The French, economically dependent on the fur trade, allied with the Algonquin speaking tribes in order to vend their, in, excuse me, in order to fend their hold on the fur commodity. The extremely brutal and bloody fighting lasted from 1642 to 1701. The French and Iroquois Wars, which I mentioned earlier in my presentation, were often referred to at the time as the Beaver Wars. The war pushed the Potawatomi westward. By 1760, the Potawatomi territory had expanded into northeastern Wisconsin, central and western Michigan, northern Indiana, and northeast Illinois. We do not know exactly when the Potawatomi settled into Glen Ellen's Churchill Woods, but it was obviously sometime during this great migration period between 1650 and 1760. The village located in Churchill Woods was by all accounts larger than average. It was situated on a natural trading route between the north to south running DuPage River and a trail running east to west from what is today Chicago to St. Charles. Philo Warren Stacy, who was brought to Glen Ellen as an infant in 1835, noted, the village was a halting place for Indians on their way to Chicago and as many as 2000 camped here at a time. Relations between the new European settlers from the east and the Potawatomi seem to have been peaceful in Glen Ellen. There is nothing we have found in the History Society's records to indicate any hostile action or intolerance on either part. Amos Churchill, grandson of Deacon Winslow Churchill, who was the first settler to come to Glen Ellen in 1834, wrote, the Indians were friendly, but very curious, watching every move that was made. They came at mealtime and stood at the door and watched and wanted to inspect any and every package that came. So Deacon Churchill had to open it and let them see what it was. In a letter written in 1916 to Joy Morton, the founder of Morton Arboretum, Joseph Yackley, who emigrated from France in 1845, wrote, the round meadow on your place was a favorite camping ground for the Indians. They came from all directions and were mostly camped here. I have seen as many as 40 come there sometimes in little tribes or families, and they would stay six weeks or two months maybe. Then they would go to Salt Creek and then they would come back again. They would trap from Bloomingdale clear down to the forks. That's uh, south where all the rivers meet. The Indians went a great deal to the Bobians. He was their friend and they were always around there. Two things to note here. First, the settlers do not speak of the Potawatomi in hostile terms or in unfriendly terms, but they do speak of them as being a separate people. Not once did they note the name of one individual Potawatomi. They are always referred to as a people who are other than us. Secondly, Note the dates of the quotes I just read to you. Did any, you notice anything odd about them? Philo Stacy arrived here in 1835. Amos Churchill wasn't born in Glen Ellen until 1842. And Joseph Yackley came here from France in 1845. This is what is odd about those dates. In 1833, the Second Treaty of Chicago gave the United States all the remaining Native American lands west of Lake Michigan, all the way to the Mississippi River. This is why the first European settlers arrived in Glen Ellen in 1834, the following year. In return for, receding, for ceding their lands, the Potawatomi received promises of various cash payments and tracts of land west of the Mississippi River. By contract, they were to have removed themselves and re re relocated west of the Mississippi by 1835. In 1838, the Potawatomi were forcibly removed out of Indiana, Wisconsin, and Michigan and were resettled in Kansas territory. Yet it is clear as late as 1845, the Potawatomi still had a presence in our area. Was there still a settlement in Churchill Woods? 
More than likely not. But without a doubt, large bands of Potawatomi did settle and travel through Glen Ellen and stay here for extended periods of time, up until about a decade before this American Civil War. Any culture that has inhabited a place as small as Glen Ellen for at least 150 years has to leave its mark. That east-west trail that ran alongside Glen Ellen's Potawatomi village that I spoke about uh, earlier has been widened into a four-lane street we now know of today as St. Charles Road. It isn't the only Potawatomi path we still use today. Parts of Ryford Road, Crescent Boulevard, and Swift Road were well-traveled long before the Churchill family arrived. In fact, if you follow the original pass, path, it leads you directly to that late woodland period uh, village, the Couch site, which predates 1000 AD. Here's another neat story. Up until 1918, Duane Street extended eastward from downtown only as far as Taylor Street. Past that point, there was a dirt road named Cherry Lane. In 1919, it was decided to dig up Cherry Lane and extend Duane Street eastward. There's a very odd looking tree on the north side of Cherry Lane about 50 feet past Taylor. It grew up about three feet before bending over toward Cherry Lane. About five feet into the bend, it turned slowly and sharply back upwards to the sky. It was odd looking. It was very odd looking. Anyway, as the road crew got to the tree, they came across the skeletal remains of a Potawatomi burial. This tree, which was still there up until it was taken down in, in uh, 2020, is known as a Native American marker tree. Native Americans have left them all throughout North America. In fact, we have writings from uh, the early Glen Ellen historian, Ada Harmon, who was born in 1860 and died in 1943, about a marker tree that was cut down near her home. The Native Americans would break the tree in this manner so it would act as a road sign of sorts. It's very possible there are other marker trees still in Glen Ellen in someone's backyard somewhere. If you see one, please let the Glen Ellen Historical Society know. My point being many of these marks the Potawatomi made on this land are still here. We just have to know what to look for. Arrowheads and other Potawatomi artifacts have been reportedly dug up in Glen Ellen Gardens for decades. Just last summer, John Fritz of Glen Ellen Historical Society found a stone scraping tool in Churchill Woods. I have little doubt that there are still many undiscovered Potawatomi artifacts out there. The Glen Ellen Historical Society is currently working to emphasize and expand our understanding of our town's native history. If you see a marker tree, please let the Glen Ellen Historical Society know if you found any native artifacts, pieces of pottery or arrowheads, for example, we'd love to put them on display for the enjoyment and education of our community. Lastly, I'd like to leave you with this. Many may be asking, why is all this so important? You may have noticed road signs when driving into Glen Ellen, which note our town as having been established in 1834, meaning people first settled here in eight, uh, about 187 years ago. This is grossly inaccurate and reflects a Eurocentric viewpoint. As I noted tonight, we know for a fact that large numbers of Potawatomi had settled a large village here over 350 years ago. Taking that into account, these signs are just off by 163 years. And I think that's quite a difference. I wanna be clear about what I'm about to say next. This is merely conjecture on my part with no solid evidence supporting it. I believe the village site in Churchill Woods predates the Potawatomi by several hundred years. Is this only a romantic notion of mine? Well, maybe, partially, but there is some uh, reasoning behind it. And hear me out. As I mentioned earlier, the path that became St. Charles Road leads directly to the Couch Village site. Rather, I would say the path by the Couch site leads directly to Churchill Woods. Remember, the last village at the Couch site was abandoned around 1000 AD. The Potawatomi didn't arrive in Churchill Woods until about 650 years later, probably around 1670s-ish. Why would the Potawatomi create a path to a village site that had disappeared seven to eight generations prior? There was nothing there when the Potawatomi arrived. The answer is they wouldn't. But then the question should be flipped and we should ask, why would the Couch people build a path to Churchill Woods? Well, here's a possible answer. One of the discoveries noticed at the Couch site was that it lacked any nearby source of chert. 
Furthermore, there wasn't any sizable deposits of chert within five miles of the village site. Why is that important? Chert is the raw material used to make arrowheads and stone tools. Remember, we noted earlier there were no horses in 1000 AD. This means everything a village needed had to be within a day's walking distance. Five miles out, five miles back adds to a total of 10 miles, or about the distance one could walk to gather material and get back home before nightfall. So the Kautz village would have to import chert from elsewhere. All right, so take a guess where the nearest available chert field is located. If you guessed Churchill Woods, you'd be right. I think that's very intriguing. Let's take this another step. If you lived at the couch site and knew it was lacking a necessary resource, but you knew that that resource was at the Churchill Woods site, and furthermore, the Churchill Woods site had all the resources you would need, why wouldn't you pick up stakes and move to the Churchill Woods and live there? Why create a path to make a long two-day walk to get the chert you needed and then turn around and carry all that stone all the way back to the couch site? That doesn't make any sense unless you couldn't move to the Churchill Woods because people were already living there. Then creating a path for the two villages to trade back and forth makes perfect sense. Just as building highways to move products to consumers makes sense today. In my mind, it seems to reason that Glen Ellen's Churchill Woods may have been inhabited hundreds of years before the Potawatomi during the same time as the couch site in 1000 AD. But here's the thing, there's no real evidence to support my hypothesis. To date, there has never been an archeological investigation of Churchill Woods as there was at the couch site, at least not yet, which leads me to some very exciting news I have to share with you. Two weeks ago, members of the Glen Ellen Historical Society met with DuPage County Forest Preserve Commissioner Jeff Garris and representatives of the Churchill Woods Forest Preserve, and most importantly, with archaeologists from the Illinois State Archaeological Survey to inspect the site where the, they, they had, we had discovered the Potawatomi artifact. At this meeting, we discussed the future construction of a bike path cutting through Churchill Woods to connect the prairie path with the Great Western Trail. And here's the kicker. By law, an archaeological survey would have to be completed prior to the path's construction. So it's possible an archaeological dig just might be coming. That would be special. If evidence of an earlier village is found, we'd have a lot more welcome signs to update. So tonight, I've been speaking about Glen Ellen's Potawatomi in historical terms. I'm a historian, and that's the kind of talking that I do. But the Potawatomi are not a people relegated to the past. They are still here and thriving. Prior to 1850, it's estimated the Potawatomi population probably hovered around 8,000. The exact number is very debatable. However, today, there are about 28,000 people who identify themselves as Potawatomi living in the United States and Canada. Even though starting in 1834, the European culture may have become the dominant culture in Glen Ellen, it has never been the sole culture to live here. And it sure wasn't the first. Uh, so anyway, thank you all for listening. And I hope you enjoyed my lecture and learned something new. Um, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts and uh, would like to answer any questions that you might have.